All right. So today we're going to talk about something that we haven't really discussed very much overall, which is algorithmic efficiency. So later this week, uh, you guys will have a talk on how to read code and, you know, good coding practices. Like, don't name all of your variables like B or like something random. Make sure your variable names and function names actually have some sort of meaning related to whatever they're describing, adding comments, etc. Um, you guys have talked about we've talked about loops and writing functions, how it's always good to keep your functions as simple as possible, right? We might say if you can why get something done with say three nested for loops, if you can do it with one, um, other you know, rules like that. A lot of some of those best practices do come back to this idea of algorithmic efficiency. So here's some resources that we're not going to go through, uh, but the gist of uh, the gist of algorithmic efficiency is in programming. It's sort of like if you're running a business, you have two main commodities that you want to keep and keep track of: how much time is being spent and how much money is being spent when you're programming we have it's fairly similar number one how long does it take to run something and number two how much storage or memory is that taking up because those are the two things that you need to have enough of or else your code will not run properly um we won't be talking about memory allocation today uh that will probably come up in a few weeks, we'll talk, start talking about like CSV files and pickles and JSON and other file formats for storing your data. But we are going to talk a lot about the time aspect. So you might say, okay, why does the time aspect matter? And let's be honest, all of the code that you guys have written so far has executed on your computers like almost instantaneously. What that's happened. That's only running so quickly because we're running very small pieces of program of code. You know, I'm sure some of you guys will probably end up working with big data sets eventually um, in in your programming careers, where you won't just be dealing with, let's say, three different users. You might have an Excel sheet of, let's say, three hundred thousand users, and each user has like thirty different attributes. And you have to run like 10 different functions on them. That now sounds like the code that you wrote in the beginning to work for three or four users, where you didn't really care about how much time it took. Now, the time that it takes your algorithms to run jumps up to being a massive priority. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. I did some work with uh, supercomputers uh, a couple of summers ago um, that we're able to use hardware acceleration. So basically, these supercomputers have like massively powerful GPUs. And for machine learning algorithms, you can help to tap into um, the GPUs of the supercomputers to help speed up how quickly you can train on data. So I remember before I used the GPU acceleration, uh, the code took more than 24 hours to train, which is a ridiculous amount of time and took a lot of credits that you had to pay for, which is not great. After I refactored my code to include that hardware acceleration, um, trim down the data set, revise the number of nodes and the data cleanup, it trained on it in four hours. That is like a massive scale reduction, all by just modifying the algorithm slightly. So even though, again, you know, the timing for both of those algorithms, if I ran on like a hundred point or 200 point data set, probably wouldn't have changed much. Like, sure, maybe a few milliseconds here or there. But when you're operating on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of data points and, and inputs, algorithmic efficiency is really, really important. Okay, so what is big O. So yeah, we're back to algorithmic efficiency. Today is focused all on the time factor. So, and what does time usually relate to? Well, if you think about it, if you do something 10 times, it usually takes longer to do the thing 10 times 
than it takes to do it one time. So when we're thinking about complexity, we're thinking when we're thinking about big O notation and algorithmic efficiency, we're thinking about how many times you have to do something based on the size of the input. Now, for example, if an algorithm takes, you know, let's say it takes in 10 data points and it or it takes in one data point and it takes one second to run. And it takes 10 data points and it takes one second to run. You know, that's pretty good. It's only, it's, there's, it's not going to change how long it takes to run, even if you give it like a million inputs. But if you put in one input and it takes one second, whereas you put in like 50 inputs and it takes like three hours, you got a bit of a problem there, especially if you're going to deal with a big data set at the end. So figuring out how long your code takes to run or how complex it is based on the number of inputs you give is extremely critical in computer science and software engineering. So the way that we can somewhat quantify this is by using something called big O notation. Have any of you guys seen or heard of big O notation before? Or is this the first time for most people? Cool, and it's even it's the first time, and that's a good thing. So the way the O notation works is, let me see if I can find a picture real quick while I'm describing this, but you guys can read this very pretty graphic while my laptop decides to lag. Um, come on. Perfect. There we go. Yeah, these are actually, these are really good pictures. So let's zoom into this one. Oh, and it just crashed. Interesting. Okay. Well, anyway, you guys can all see like the free code camp image now, right? Or could this one? Yep. Okay, cool. So the way big O notation works is... Essentially, it does the process that we were just talking about. So, you know, if you put in one input, how long does it take to run? If you put in two inputs, how long does it take to run? What about 10? What about 100? And you basically get a bunch of data points where the number of elements is on one side and the length of time it takes to run is on the other. And basically, you just plot those data points in some sort of graph. So that's essentially what, what big O notation shows. It's the function that fits whatever runtime your code has. So for example, O of one basically means that it's a flat line. So for any number of elements, your code takes the same number of same amount of time to run. So if you have one element, it takes 20 seconds. If you have a thousand elements, it takes 20 seconds. That is like the absolute, well, not absolute best case. I mean, you could do better hypothetically, but realistically speaking, if your code can do that, you're basically a genius. Like that is really hard to achieve in general. Then after that, uh, we have O of N. O of N is essentially a linear correspondence. So it would be like saying, um, my code, if I, if I put in one input, my code takes one second. If I put in two in, or if I put in two inputs, uh, or sorry, if I put in one element, it takes two seconds. If I put in two elements, it takes four seconds. If I put in three elements, it takes six seconds. And you can see that like, based on this description for every element I input, it takes the number of elements times two seconds to run which is basically a linear relationship. Then we can do the exact same thing. If a code is O of N squared, then it takes, you know, at that time goes with square function and, and so on. These are some other functions that, that you could use to describe how your code runs. We won't go into the math part in too much detail, but if any of you guys are math geeks, um, a really fun exercise, and there are some of these on the web that I can send, um, is to basically take a function, run a timer on it for various 
uh, numbers of elements, make the sort of plot, and then use curve fitting in order to figure out what function best describes that time line. And then you, from that, you can figure out what type of uh, big O notation or algorithmic efficiency your code has. Are there any questions overall about what big O notations before we jump into how exactly we can use it? Or about why it might be useful? Okay, so back to the presentation. So as it was, as it shows here, um, so O of one, the speed doesn't depend on how big the data set is. For log n, it depends on the logarithm. So you know the most date, like the more data, the time will still increase, but not by a crazy amount. Versus for something like O of n squared or O of two to the n. The more data you include, the time that it takes to run goes up like almost vertically. Like it's bad. So after a point, you know, you would basically reach a maximum number of inputs before your code takes way too long to run for the computer to compute. So let's see some examples of this in practice. So the ideal easiest option is O of one also known as constant time. So, you know, a simple example of that is checking if the first element of an array is red. Why is this O of one? Well, let's say the array has like two elements in it. It only needs to check the first element. So it has, it takes one step to run. Okay, what if I have an array with 15 elements? Well, still it only needs to check the first element. So it has one step. What if it has a thousand? Same thing, one step. The amount of time it takes to check the first element, which is really all you need, doesn't change. It doesn't depend on how big the array is. So that's why this is a constant time function. Now, slightly more complicated is going to be a linear time function, which is what we talked about in that graph that was that straight line. And a good example of something that traditionally has linear time is a for loop. Now, why would a for loop be linear time? Any Anyone want to volunteer an explanation or have ideas? Because the thing you're iterating through can be of any theoretical size. Exactly, right. So, I mean, you know, if the array you're iterating through has 10 elements, how many times are you going to run through it? 10 times. If at the very, at the worst, right? I mean, in this case, where does it contain it? You can just run through it one time. Let's, you know, let's say array, the first element in the array is the value. However, another thing I, I forgot to mention is big O notation for algorithmic efficiency is generally based on worst case scenarios. So let's say, you know, that the item, that value is not even in the array or values all the way at the end of the array. How long is this thing going to take to run? Well, for a 10 element array, it's going to run through this 10 times because that's the way the for loop works. It iterates through every single term. Okay, wonderful. What if, you know, it's, let's say, a hundred element array. It's going to run through it a hundred times and so on. So you can see, I mean, as the data set gets bigger, as the number of inputs in that array gets bigger, the amount of time it takes to run the array, to run the function, gets bigger by a proportional amount. And that's all thanks to this lovely for loop. Now we can get worse than this. We can go to quadratic time. Um, so quadratic time it most often occurs when you have a nested for loop. So this is why we like to avoid nested for loops, especially when you're dealing with big amounts of data. So let's think about why this is quadratic time. So let's say that I have a three element array. So it has like A, B, and C. 
Why would this be quadratic time? Well, we would have to track the values of number one and number two. So let's see, uh, what's, what's an array we can come up with? 13, 25, and 19, hypothetically, right? So let's, let's start our counters. So first we're gonna initialize number one and number two. So we'll first start off with number one being 13, and then number two is also 13, right? That's what happens the first time that we enter both for loops. So that's, that's the first iteration. Then we run through, then again, we don't exit the for loops because we still have to update number two. So number one is still 13, but number two is now moved from 13 to 25. Then again, we're still at number two is still moving. So we have 13 for number one and then 19 for number two. Okay, so we've run through the array completely for number two. So then we go back and now we can re-advance number one. So number one goes from 13 to 25, and then we restart the count for number two. So we go 25 for number one, and then 13 for number two. And then number two, after it appends it, the number two moves from the 13 to the 25. So then you get 25, 25, and then we get 25, 19. And then we're done running through the array for number two. So then we go back to number one, and we change number one from 25 to be 19. And then again, we do the same thing all over again. So the end result is we have run through, we've essentially run through this overall loop nine different times. And you can see that by counting up all the combinations of number one and number two that, that we've written down. Another way to see that, how long is the array? The array is three elements long. So this is gonna be three. This is also gonna be three. Three times three equals nine. So for a three element array, you're running through this nine times. For a four element array, you'll run through this four by four, which is 16 times. For a 10 element array, you're going to run 100 steps. Now going from, so three elements, it was nine steps. 10 elements, which isn't a super big jump, is a hundred steps, which is like a lot more. Then we can go to, you know, let's say 50 elements, you're running 2,500 steps. So you see how like big this number of steps is getting overall? That's why quadratic time is really bad because the more data you put in, the time gets worse by like multiple factors. So if possible, this is why we always recommend that you try, try, try to avoid nested for loops. Because again, for big data sets, you'll have problems. Any questions about what we've just talked about for, um, Linear time, O of 1 or O of n squared. No questions at all? Okay, coolio. So let me go ahead. Oh, yeah, there's a key takeaway slide. Here we go. So don't bother, don't worry about the searching through hashes versus arrays. This is something that you guys will get to in the data structures um, discussion um, later this week or in the next module. Um, point number two is huge. Please, please avoid nested loops. They are bad. Do not use nested loops. Um, and then lastly, if you find yourself writing code that has poor big O complexity, try to make it so that it's not this way. So for example, for the O of n squared quadratic time function for uh, getting you know, all possible combinations within an array, there should be a way to, there may be a way to do this without 
doing a loop within a loop. That's that's the main message from points two and three. Okay, so let's see what else. Uh, did we have to talk about? So we talked about linear time. We talked about quadratic time. Um, there's also logarithmic time, um, where which is sort of like an intermediary between linear time and O of 1. That's usually what you like to go for. Um, then there's like things like n factorial, which are really bad. You can have like exponential time. Um, and in general, you almost always would like to stay in this lower region. If you can keep it so that, you know, for the number, the length of time increases as the number of inputs increases. Okay, that's that's fine. But if you get to any worse than that, you're you're in a bit of trouble. All right. Any any questions about this so far? Okay, cool. So let's think about now that we've talked about what big O notation is, how can we use it in in practice? So let me just define like a uh, custom list is let me just type some random numbers. Um, okay, that'll do. Um, let's let's write some functions that can do things with these. So I guess first of all, um, the main way we have two ways of evaluating the big O notation of a function. For simple functions that just have like one or two loops. We can just go through and like we did through the slide deck, we can mentally check, okay, how long is this going to take to run in terms of the number of steps? Now, the other thing we can do is use a timer in Python. Have you guys discussed how to use the time module in Python before? Yeah, we used it for a little bit on uh, one of the challenges. Okay, perfect. So yeah, that that I mean that's usually the the easiest way to time how long a function takes to run. So here, why don't why don't we just try that now? So you know we can just import time. Um, you can also use again. There are other modules that have similar functions, but we just won't use those. Um, so let's let's make a, a you know a o of one function, and we'll just call it uh, my list, and we'll just say return twelve. So this function will return twelve every single time. So okay, how many elements are in this? Six elements here. Let's make it like five. Let's say custom list one is going to have like one element this one has like five elements and then let's just do a custom list with 10 just you know to give ourselves some variety um let's make it not duplicate so let's see one two three four five seven eight nine ten okay so let's 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 try some of these functions so we can say that our start time is going to be time dot time. Then we are going to run a one on custom list one. And then the end time is going to be time dot time. And then we'll just print and minus start. So let's see, you know, how long this takes to run for um, one element or five elements and for 10 elements. So if we run this, we see here that the time elapsed is like about 60 milliseconds. That's, or yeah, 60 milliseconds, uh, sorry. 60 microseconds, apologies, this is in seconds. That's a pretty small amount of time to run on, uh, 
you know, on with one element. Now let's see what happens if we run the same code with five elements. We see the time is pretty comparable. I mean, like, sure, it's about half, but I mean, that's realistically just the difference because of my computer being obstinate today. And we can do the same thing with the list of 10 elements. And we see here that like, it takes about the same amount of time to run this code for something that's got one element, for five elements, and for 10 elements. So based on that, I, mean, I, I kind of already said it, but which type of big O notation would this function observe? What type of algorithmic efficiency? Constant. Perfect. Yep, this is constant. Because again, it's going to return 12 all the time. It doesn't matter what you put into it, which is great. Okay, so let's try, let's try another one. So let's say I do 4i in uh, my list. We're going to do um, thing is one thing times equals i, and then we'll just return thing at the end. So before I run this, what do you guys think the algorithmic efficiency is of this and why? Linear. Okay. Um, why would it be linear? Because it depends on uh, the length of the list that you're putting in. Okay, everyone else agree? Okay, well, let's let's check. So, you know, let's test it with one element. It's pretty quick. Let's check it with five elements. Okay, it's, it's still pretty quick. Um, 10. Okay, yeah, it's, it, I mean, you won't really see a difference with such small data sets. Um, I remember usually when we're, I like to test things for big O notation, like for complicated functions, I usually try to randomly generate a data set that's, I usually try to do it around 100, like on the scale of like 50 to 100 elements or bigger so that you can really see how long it takes for it to run. Um, but I, we won't be doing that now just for for like sake of the exercise. Um, but there, you know, one of the assignments for homework is to determine the time complexity of, of various, uh, various types of functions. So I don't want to show too many of them right now. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be O of N uh, or linear time because again, you know, you're start the number of times you iterate through the for loop depends on how many things you're iterating over, which comes from my list. Now, what if instead I said that this is going to be for i in range five and thing times equals my list i? Uh, let's see. Eden, what do you think the time complexity of the function is now? Is it still going to be linear? Um, probably not. I'm not sure. I'm still trying to get the hang of it. Okay, so let's let's think through it. So, let's say that my list has, let's say that it has five elements. So we enter this loop. This how many times are we going to go through the loop? Five times. Are you talking about five the... times. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Nothing. Okay. But yeah, so we're going to run through this loop five times. Now, let's say that we change my list from something with five elements to this thing with 10 elements. How many times are we going to run through the loop now? 10. Hmm. Why would we run through the loop 10 times? I mean, is it iterating? Well, I mean, there's 10 elements, right? Mm -hmm. But what is it? What is the loop iterating over? And you're keeping the five? Like for I in range? Yeah. I'm not sure. 
So the thing, so the reason when I changed it to this slightly different version of the function, um, the, the number of times we're looping over the for loop, it doesn't depend on my list at all anymore. It, it's just dependent on whatever number I hard code in here. So regard if my list has three elements, this will run five times because we have it being in range five. If my list has 300 elements, the same thing. This would still iterate five times. My list does not affect how often you run through the loop in this case. So even though this function does have a for loop, it's still going to be a constant time function. Does that does that kind of make sense? Or is there are there any points of confusion? I kind of get it, sort of. Okay. Yeah, it, it gets a little bit easier as I think once you guys actually start playing with it for the homework, it'll it'll help a little bit. Um but yeah. So are there any questions so far about this?